Welcome back to another episode of the EP Growth Podcast. Uh, excited to have on today's uh, podcast another guest, Adam Rice of AJR, AJR sorry, Counseling and Coaching. So Adam has been uh, working in the mental health industry now for 20 plus years, working with a range of different clients, um, but based with a firm belief that we need to address the, the mental, physical, and emotional elements of someone's health to truly get the holistic outcomes um, with people from all walks of life. Um, but excitingly, Adam's now um, making some of these techniques and skills available through external programs that he's developing and delivering uh, on the Central Coast, Newcastle, Sydney, all around the place. So uh, welcome, Adam. Did I, how did I go covering it all, mate? <laughs> uh, thanks for having me on today. It's good. It's great. Awesome, mate. Keen, uh, keen to, to have a chat. But um, look, let's start it off. What's the, what happens in a consultation from the mental health care provider's perspective. So obviously a lot of people listening to this podcast are familiar with what a, an allied health practitioner might do, be it an EP or a physio, something like that. But I think there's not a lot of information out there or awareness out there of what consult might look like with someone such as yourself. Yeah. Well, look, it's, it's an interesting question and a good one, uh, but it's, it's probably a little bit of a hard one to actually answer because uh, I guess in a first consultation, we're looking at like assessment, basically, um, finding out what the problem is and, um, and also, also what the person's done about that before, like or if they've done anything about the, the, the problem uh, you know, in the past and what's helped and what hasn't helped. Uh, I think what's really important to recognize here in, in like a consult is basically that we 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 need to create strategies or, or use strategies that are going to work for that particular client. Clients come in here with a range of different things. So it's not just one thing they come in with, it's like a whole multitude of things, a whole multitude of things. Um, that being said, you know, we're not just focusing on the client either. We're also focusing on the client's family and the people that they're around because mental health doesn't affect just the person that's got the problem. It affects everything that's going on around them. So I guess in essence, in the consult, the first thing is, yeah, an assessment and finding out what's what's going on. Then we kind of work out what strategies would work best for that particular client. Um we like to make it very easy here. We don't like to um, kind of make it too complicated. <laughs> it's it's very client focused and we will hone in mostly on what the client specifically needs, I guess, in a sense. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's, I'm trying to sort of look at this and, and I'm looking at it with obviously an EP background there and there are a lot of similarities, right? So if we have someone come into our clinic and it's a, for a physical health component, we're yeah, we're looking at it and going, okay, does this person need to do a high intensity session or do they need to do you know, various other skills or elements out of the, the EP toolkit sort of thing? And, and you're really doing the same thing. You're weighing up like what approach, what do I need to do with this person based on their individual needs? Yeah, absolutely. Well, well if you think about it this way, you know, the, the mind and body are connected, therefore they affect each other. So usually if somebody's not mentally well, they're usually not physically well either. Um, you know, a good example might be depression. You know, often their motivation's really low. So they might sleep a lot or, um, uh, you know, or they might they might start to feel guilty because they're, they're not feeling motivated. You know, so there's a lot of different things that kind of happen. And, and vice versa, if you're not fi physically feeling well, often you're not mentally feeling well either. Yeah. So it's about kind of using that, um, that approach, that whole client-centered approach around what's going on for that client, I guess, yeah, in, in that sense. Yeah, I guess on that as well, you can probably have that, that debate is, is it the chicken or the egg in terms of like, are you physically not well because your mental health is, is struggling or the other way around? And I guess what you're saying is, well, we need to try and address both yeah. um, to, to, to get the, the end result. But I guess one of the, the questions that I always had or, or it was a concern of mine, when I had a client that might be seeing a mental health care provider was right. My job here is don't contribute. Don't make it worse. It's probably a better phrase there. So is there, are there certain things that a, an EP or a physio allied healthcare provider might do or not do to sort of complement what is happening in a mental health session? And I get that it could be very different based on, on what you're seeing them for, but um, yeah. as an example, um, we've had clients before and we've been able to speak with their, uh, mental health care provider and they said listen don't worry about doing questionnaires or 
um, anything like that, that's doing different things like that. Just avoid that. Just concentrate on getting them active and this being an outlet for them in their day to day, because we're covering all of that elsewhere. Um, doing more questionnaires was just adding onto it for them. So are there things like that we should consider? Well, uh, look, I, uh, again, that would probably come down to that particular needs of that client, I guess. But I don't think there's anything that you could really do that would make things worse, so to speak. I mean, um, <laughs> we know that exercise, for instance, it, you know, increases, you know, your endorphins and it makes you feel better. And most people that do even uh, like even people who are depressed and they do get out for a walk, it's like a it's like a major kind of shift for them. And it does make them feel a little bit better. I think if you're not really focusing on their mental health, I guess, in, in one of your sessions, like when you're getting them act, active or whatever, but it's actually helping a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think, yeah, I mean, I couldn't imagine you guys kind of going out with somebody and having a big consult with them around their mental health. It'd be more around, okay, let's get you active. Let's get you feeling better. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so it's it's probably, you, you, probably, you guys are probably a really good part of the puzzle to put in because, um, you're doing it from a different angle. So you're actually working with their mental health as well, I guess, in the sense that you're getting them physically active, but it's helping them to mentally feel better. For sure. Yeah. I guess where there might be some crossover, I'll try and sort of speak more clearly to it is in trying to, so our initial consults would be similar to you in trying to understand that individual and, and where they're at as a person, not just physically, because getting them to take on some exercise, will, we will need to understand their values and beliefs and motivations and all those things as well. So we're trying to do that. And then if in certain goals we're setting or approaches we're trying to take to encourage exercise might be something that adds to a stress response for that person, things like that. That would be something that I think um, trying to sort of consider if they're seeing someone like yourself as well. But I think the real, the real thing that um, would need to happen there is quality communication between both the health professionals in that space, given there's so much nuance and variation amongst every individual and practitioner. So I guess then on that would be what's the best way, like for, speaking for yourself, obviously, but what's the best way for uh, an allied healthcare provider to, to get in contact and to communicate with you about a, a patient in that sense? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, that, that could work quite well. I think, you know, you would always need the client's uh, permission to do that anyway. However, I mean, I'm thinking more so here, I would actually communicate more with the client and ask them, you know, when, when you know, there's nothing wrong with art. People get scared about asking people who have a mental health issue or mental illness. They're scared that they might say something that's going to upset them. And the thing is that it's probably not going to happen that way. But if you ask them directly and you get their feedback around it, they'll more than likely tell you the truth about what, what it is that it's doing for them. I guess in that sense of, um, you know, I, I, as I said, I couldn't imagine anything you guys do which would contribute to making that person's mental health problem worse. But um, but if you ask them directly, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. And, and that's probably getting it better. It's getting that information from the clients probably better um, first up and then pr- probably talk to the health allied health professional, I'd say. Yeah, right. That's, that's awesome advice right there. I think that's really powerful. And, and and as soon as you said, I was like, wow, yeah, like absolutely. We've had um, some students come through here actually just as an example of this and and we'll set up little mock scenarios where um, we'll have them do an, an initial consult with just the team here and we'll we'll provide little sort of things that it could be sticking points like um, in terms of their, their interviewing process and we'll say, oh, there's a mental health component or something like that. And oftentimes we'll see the student sort of skip over it like ask the question get the answer but then not do anything more with it and then later on when sort of what happened there like did you not want to go down that path i was like oh look i really didn't know what to do what to say or how to how to deal with it so they left it which is not awesome but they i guess they didn't feel confident enough to as you just said that just have a genuine from a caring place how does this work for you how does that make you feel and you know, i guess what you're saying is yeah be empowered have that conversation yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you just said something really interesting, and people don't uh, think this is. They people think this is really strange when I tell them this, but I never ask any of my clients how does that make you feel. And okay. I actually, because what it does is it implies that the situation has control over them. So I'll ask them. Uh, I'll say the same thing, but in a different way. So how do you feel about that? Because yeah. that's come up, and sometimes the answer is a little bit different. 
Yep. You know, it's, a, it's a little bit different, but it's coming from them and it's coming from a place of um, personal power, I guess, in a sense. I think we're going to get into some of the, the, the programs and um, courses that you teach shortly. I think that's a, a good segue into that. But before we do, let's say we've got someone, uh, a, a younger practitioner, less experienced, maybe even someone that is more experienced practitioner, but they're not sure how to deal with um, whatever they're presented with, right? From a mental health care point of view, when, when would you suggest, okay, well then this would be the time to reach out to someone like yourself. How, how would they engage you? Mm. Well, there's a number of different ways that people can engage with any healthcare professional, I guess. Um, you know, we, we, we see people who come in under like some pr funded programs, sure. uh, um, people who get referred by their GP, uh, we see people under NDIS um, and we see people privately as well. And we have a couple of Medicare um, items that we can also get. But I guess the the, the first point of contact is, is either your GP or some people don't feel like, or some people don't want to go and see their GP about a problem either. So we have a lot of people that will just come in and pay privately and then you don't need a GP referral at all. But I think the, the, the point of when to contact somebody is when, the when the client knows to contact i guess uh, don't let things get so bad that it's really hard to fix you know if, if you feel as though you're heading down a road that's kind of that's going to cause more problems later on start start with it early you know um early intervention is really the key in anything you know so um, even with exercise i guess you know early interventions key i remember when i had my i had a really bad back injury you know, many years ago um my mindset around that at the time was kind of I want to get well you know so I engaged and I made sure I went to things but there's a lot of people that don't either you know okay. and um and when you're talking about you know talking with other health professionals and that some sometimes actually felt like I was left out of the equation mm. um so it was really important to me to kind of have some element of control over what I was doing and what what was right I guess in that sense does yeah. that answer the question? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, what you're saying there is, is sooner the better. And, and if you're not sure within yourself of, can I, within my consults sort of provide a motivation element or appropriate levels of uh, accountability, for example, things like that, well then let's include someone like yourself that is well-versed in those skill sets and, and have multiple different people helping this person towards yeah. an outcome. So, yeah. and it, it, yeah, just just don't don't be afraid to um, kind of seek some help if you need it. There's nothing wrong with seeking help. It's it's a really important step. Yeah, I, I think um, speaking on the the practitioner side of things, I think sometimes it's a, a case of ego where it's no, 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 I've got this. I know exactly what I'm doing, and not refer out to to anybody else, let alone um, someone they're not too sure about. Like what do they do it's, and often cases for uh eps it's i'm not sure what a psych is going to do so i'm not going to refer there but i mean as you just said communication um will sort of help to illuminate that but um the other thing as well that you said there and, and we had this discussion uh, elsewhere the other day is you know some people don't want to go and see their gp to get a referral or perhaps it's a workplace thing where um we might be seeing clients through workers comp for a physical issue, but they're really struggling with a psychological component and they absolutely do not want to go through the process again for the mental component with workers comp. And so you end up in this situation where, okay, well, it's certainly there. We're not going to go and see, a, see anyone specialist about this through workers comp. Could you go of your own accord? And, and that's to what you're saying there is just let's get it started sooner. Uh, Cause we, we did hear as well, like, yeah, someone had a, a particular issue in it and the question was asked like how long would this have taken to get on top of or to make real progress if it was addressed six months ago and the response was like two to three sessions instead of sort of two three four five months that's right that's absolutely right you know and and some people like under workers comp as well they they're, they're kind of forced to go to some of these things as well and they don't like that um i've actually had quite a few people who are seeing people under workers comp but have come to see me privately because they didn't they didn't feel comfortable where they were but they felt as though they didn't have choice yeah, yeah. certainly see that where 
yeah, if the, it's just another element, I guess, in that process that the person feels they have no control over. That's and, right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I guess that comes back to patient-centered care, right? They need to give Absolutely. the information and make the best possible best possible call. But I guess um, some of the applications of that for, for EPs as well or allied health practitioners as well, like some of these tools and, and understandings can be applied to clients, but also themselves. So I think in the day-to-day -day for an allied healthcare practitioner, working with people who have their own emotional concerns, you can start to carry that yourself. Mm. It's, is it uh, it's normal for an, like an allied health practitioner to sort of reach out to someone like yourself and like, what's what are sort of some things that you can cover with them to help them manage their day-to-day -day stresses or you know, fatigue, things like yeah. that? Uh, look, at it's a really good question too. Um, I, I, I see a lot of people, for, uh, like a, a lot of other clinicians or healthcare providers, healthcare, uh, allied health professionals for clinical supervision. And supervision is really, really important, I think, um, to attend. I go to supervision as well. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great professional development tool. Um, and it might be just something, it might be a client that you have that you're not kind of sure how to work with them or, or whatever but there there are ways that you can actually bring up certain things that are happening at work in a in a confidential and um and supportive way and maybe get different ideas on how you might approach certain things so i think supervision is really really important for any healthcare professional but also um also some counseling if you feel as though you need it like again it's just because you're a healthcare worker doesn't mean that you're um, you know, the, you avoid mental health problems or stress yeah, or some sort of, or, super you know, it, we still have it. We still get it. You know, yeah. I know I do. And, and some days there, there are even times where, you know, if I know I'm not a hundred percent there or a hundred percent right in, in my mindset or my headspace, well, I'll actually cancel clients because I don't want to, um, see them. If I'm not right, how am I going to be right for them? Sure. Uh, so it's a, I think supervision is a really important thing and and taking time out to make sure that that sort of stuff happens i think it's sorry adam that's right i was just saying it's really important yeah yeah and it's really um i think great self-awareness which is another topic in itself for you to be able to recognize that and and make sure that when you are at work you're showing up as your best self uh yeah it's yeah that has so many different flow and effects which which can become different conversations but I think it also starts to impact in places like team harmony and, and different workplaces and cultures where you, know, you might be through lack of an outlet, ability to talk about it, to manage these emotional concerns, buildups, insert phrase, <laughs> yeah. you're showing up at work as a, not your best self, which is impacting on others there. And then all of a sudden your relationships with other people is now not what it could be, what it, what it was. I mean, it's, it's really going to help out with that as well, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I always think about like the three A's for me. Um, and I actually do that with my clients too. But, you know, the awareness, because awareness is everything. Uh, awareness, acceptance and action. You know, you can't action something you haven't accepted and you can't accept something you're not aware of. But if those three A's are kind of in place, well, then, you know, you know that there's something you, you need to do, you know, and take some action with it. The three A's, awareness. Acceptance. awareness acceptance and action i think that's a, a great framework worth a list straight there i think if people can consider those things in a, in a range of different um yeah. applications in their day-to-day -day, i think that would be powerful but i mean i'm i'm definitely no expert on it and i think you are but i think we're getting into um something that you're quite passionate about something that you are now teaching which i think is awesome i want to talk about it today but uh nlp is that a yeah. component out of NLP? And can you talk to us a little bit more about oh, that? Oh, it is a little bit. It is a little bit. There's a lot of NLP stuff that's actually kind of already out there, but it's just that you become a little bit more consciously aware of things, I guess. But yeah, I I, I actually, interestingly enough, how I fell into NLP was um, uh, I had some colleagues that went and did the course and I kind of noticed that there was a bit of a change around their mindset and what they were doing and I thought I need to get a piece of this action, so, <laughs> so I, went I went and did the I went and did the course, and um, it was really interesting because I, I came out of that the first the first practitioner course anyway. Uh, I came out feeling ex extremely different, and my mindset had completely shifted. 
And it's kind of been a staple. I, I practiced NLP in my every single day for myself, but also in my with my clients, um, with my family. I thought it was so important that I actually paid for my daughters to go and do it. And and I think that really, I, I think they should actually have NLP taught at schools because we would have so much less anxiety and so much less um, uh, self esteem issues and all that sort of stuff because it's it's such a a powerful kind of set of tools that that help you to manage things in life so much better you know it helps you to be a master communicator it helps you to recognize patterns that you're in it helps you to reframe situations and and look at things from a completely different view um yeah yeah it's it's certainly something that i've I've just sort of come across it really and and hence really keen to talk to you about it but um, for those that have been listening to the podcast before, they will have a bit of an understanding that I started here in our clinic as an EP and that's my background of, was doing that for a long time and got to a point where I was feeling confident with it and, and able to sort of communicate, I think, confidently with, with people I was seeing. But then my role started to transition towards uh, managing our team here and then became solely managing our team here, which was virtually purely communication and, mm-hmm. and managing different personalities and different experiences and uh, experience levels, things along along those lines. And so my professional development went from, yeah, I'll go and do that shoulder course to um, I need to level up my communication. And I think um, EQ, my, my emotional um, IQ, I, I need mm-hmm. to sort of level that up a little bit and doing different readings and things like that and eventually stumbled across NLP and just sort of reading over a little bit. And I think a large part of it is, uh, understanding the other person and trying to consider them and their perspectives on things to then uh, influence your approach with them or your engagements with them. Is that a, a sort of premise yeah. of NLP? Oh, absolutely. Look, it, 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 the communication side of things in NLP, we, we look at rapport and being able to get into rapport with somebody instantly. And actually one of the interesting things, I see a lot of kids and um, one of the most common questions I get asked by parents is, how did you get my kid to start talking to you in five minutes when we've been going somewhere else and it's taken them like six months to get three words out of their mouth? And it simply comes down to using, like being able to get into rapport with someone really quickly, but also being able to pick up on their representation system. So how they filter information and being able to talk in that language to them. So everything that goes in just kind of sinks in very easily. Um, I mean, if you look at, I mean, we're all in patterns. We, we're in patterns all the time. And um, even when you're in the shower, you'll have a certain routine that you do. You're not kind of thinking about it, but you're doing things uh, in an unconscious way. Well, it's like driving a car. You know, before you knew how to drive a car, you didn't know how to drive one. So you were unconsciously unskilled. And then you, know, you may get your learner's permit. You may go out for a uh, a driving lesson and that's when you become consciously unskilled so you know you need to learn it and then you get your license for the first four weeks you're driving around you're watching the traffic lights the pedestrians the car in front and that's when you're consciously skilled so you're in the process of doing it but now you just get in the car and drive and you can even get to your destination and not even remember the journey but you've still stopped at the traffic lights and the car in front and the pedestrians um, and that's when you're unconsciously skilled. So you're just doing things automatically. And it, with NLP, we're, allowed, we're able to kind of look at that and go, okay, we need to change something here so we can change the pattern and unlearn some that thing and then learn something else to replace it, I guess. Yeah. Does that I, make- <laughs> I think so. Yeah. And it's a, yeah, I think as you, as you were saying that, I'm like, that's, just, that's definitely the the progression that I've gone on and, and, and remain on sort of had no idea of where my communication was at and and how it needed to change and then i became aware of like i've got to do something here i need to improve this here and sort of remaining on that on that progress on that journey there and i think anyone can sort of break down various aspects of their lives and what they're doing in their lives and that's the process so it's it's cool to sort of get that into into a framework as you've just put it but um what you just said there that i found interesting was everyone interprets life random through their own filters um, mm-hmm. and that's sort of harping back to a, a different quote that I, I liked um, that I've heard before with with different mentors and people that I work with but um, it was if the student hasn't learned you haven't taught and I think that's mm-hmm. a, a great quote and um, something that I 
again, reading about NLP is another one that they have there. The, the meaning of your communication is the response you get. Yeah. And absolutely. I think, yeah. I think that's a, a couple of great quotes there to what you're saying is that you need to adapt what you're talking about and communication strategies, your, your whole engagement with someone towards how they're interpreting you and the, and the experiences around them. Absolutely. Well, that, and what you were talking about then were, were some what we call presuppositions in NLP. And presuppositions are, are great to use as a way of filtering everyday life. And one of my favorite presuppositions is the law of requisite variety. And that means, uh, you know, the person with the most flexibility will control the situation or the system. And um, that's not being flexible and going out of your way and doing things for people, but it's kind of being flexible in, in how you manage your own state, but also how you might want to communicate with somebody or, you know, being flexible enough to understand, oh, that person's rep system, you know, they're all auditory. So I'm going to use a bit of auditory language here. Um, being able to use hypnotic language and using meta model language. So, you know, when we when we communicate with NLP, we, we use I use a lot of hypnotic language, uh, but we also use meta model, which is actually a complete opposite to um, to hypnotic language, and that's kind of questions that you that challenge surface statements. So you get to the crux of what's going on at that really unconscious level, I guess. Yeah, so. I think there's some cool applications in there um, towards things like micromanaging. Uh, yeah, and, and even mindsets of like this is how it gets done. This is the right way, and so that's what we're doing. So in terms of being flexible and then being able to communicate to someone on their level, and ultimately get to an outcome is is all of those things you were just talking about. <laughs> and uh, I'm not not ashamed. It's a growth thing, but I, I think earlier on in in my career, I was very that's how we do it. That's how it needs to be done. I think it gave me confidence in terms of well, I know, and then moving on from that now, it's like well there are a lot of ways to do this and this way, because it works for me might not be the right person, right way for this person over here. And so now it doesn't work like that. And I think I'm, I'm seeing that now where we might have um, an, a new employee start with us and we're taking them through different processes and things like that. And uh, I might be explaining something and I'll say, Oh, I'm more of a visual learner or I like to learn through, through doing and then being, a, okay, cool, I've heard that and now adapt and then present to them on that level. And I guess that's the, the premise of what you've been saying there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's, NLP is a really good tool for, it does so many things, but one of the things you were just saying there, and actually funny enough, I had a post go out on one of the social media things the other day saying the most dangerous sentence in the human language is we've always done it this way, you know, and, <laughs> And, and it's so true that there's multiple ways of doing things. And, and you're right, like, you know, even in my room here, uh, I've set it up for everybody's representation system. And I didn't realize I'd done that until I learned NLP. But, you know, I've got, um, I've got rugs in here and cushions and carpet, which is for the kinesthetic people. And then the, there's often, there's always music playing in the background here. And that's for the people who are auditory. Then I've got the board up here and the colors around here are for the visual people. And then there's some books and the computer and some stuff around for the internal dialogue people. So it's kind of, um, have those those different rep systems, but in what order is, is what's important and how we're filtering information. And one of the presuppositions um, is, is about uh, the map is not the territory. And that's about respecting somebody else's model of the world. And if you can be flexible enough to be able to slip into using a communication method that's going to work better for that client, um, it, it's 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 a it's really a dream, really in lots of ways. You know, I, I see like I do a lot of couples therapy too, and often you know I'll, I'll kind of elicit their representation system and go, oh, now I know why they do this. <laughs> you know, but when they know about it, they can actually work with it. They can work with it. You know, so like if you had a, a couple in here once who were, one, she was very visual and he was very kinesthetic and in her house, everything had to be absolutely neat and tidy and in its place. And he would come home, take off his pants, get a beer out of the fridge and go and sit, sit in, the, in the chair. She, and, and so he was very kinesthetic, you know, and- um, He might be anyway, just one of my friends, I think, there actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, but when, once they knew that, he kind of went, well, I can work with that a little bit. He said, I still like to come home and have a beer and take my pants off and sit in the lounge. But he said, look, I'll, I'll make sure I clean it all up and fix it all up when I go. So it was kind of just 
people can compromise and and understand each other a lot better using NLP. Yeah, and I think what you said there before is your your skill sets in being able to get through that process quickly allows you to do things like um, build rapport and, and end up having flowing conversations with someone that otherwise wasn't speaking that, that child yeah. was talking about. But um, it's interesting there, like the 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 crossover in, in topics that I've been reading a book recently called Own It, and it's about um, accountability and and different ways. Well, the the bad rap that accountability gets really in terms of. Um, we only talk about it when someone's messed up as opposed to encouraging people to lean into it and, and be drawn to accountability is a, a good thing. And I think um, NLP is touching on that because a person's interactions with accountability is really shaped on their interpretation of the events that have led to it or, or coming around it. And so unless you can understand how that person is viewing different situations and context, their experience of accountability is going to be vastly different to what yours is. And so, Absolutely. yeah. So in, in, in that example, you just had there with a I think husband and wife or certainly a couple um, having different experiences around accountability and like, can't believe you just left your pants there sort of thing, but not understanding the world through each other's eyes. And I think that's a great aspect or component of NLP is it encourages that. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It really, look, it opened my mind up to a lot of things and, and actually it did a lot of things for me. Actually, I was, I was in a really, um, I was in a really bad relationship too, you know, uh, and it was kind of interesting. One of the reasons I went to do NLP was to communicate better um, with my partner, but it was actually NLP that helped me leave. So it's kind of like, it's 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 a huge mindset um it's a mindset tool that completely changed my 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 life. I mean, you you remember I had that really severe back pain, and it was actually during NLP. It was in the middle of it because I did some work on that. In the middle of it, in the middle of that course, I kind of realized, wait a minute, I'm not I'm not in any pain. It was really weird, and and even now I, I still get like a niggle every now and again. But now I know NLP. I know my body's trying to tell me something. But I, I had an MRI done uh, a few months ago, and they said you've got a really bad back injury. Are you in pain? I said, no, no, I'm not in any pain. I got off all my medication, everything. It was just a, a, a huge life change. And since I've implemented it in, into my coaching and, um, and, and my therapy side of things, it's really made people have some, it's helped people have some really great outco- outcomes because it just it reframes a lot of situations for you. And, you know, being able to reframe something that somebody says, you know, can be, really important but really uh great for that person as i actually had a lady not long ago and she came in she said oh, i'm always anxious i'm so anxious and and i said well you know anxiety is 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 an important thing for us to have you know it's our protection response and she'd never kind of looked at anxiety in that way she said, oh yeah actually it is and um you know another lady says well you know i'm, I'm always so hyper vigilant i'm looking at everything i said well isn't it good that you can keep yourself safe you know, so it's kind of like it just kind of adds some things or, or some elements to what people are filtering in their own mind and helping them to have a different way to think about it. Mm. I think it's a, initially there with a, a couple of points. So speaking towards your your own back issue there, I think it really does highlight the importance of having a multidisciplinary approach to, to those sorts of things. Like there was obviously the physical component happening there and then we introduced, you introduced some, some of the NLP components there and a rapid improvement. So like that speaks to that in itself there. Um, what was I going to say? It's left me. But the, <laughs> the, the other, remember it in a second. It'll come back to me. Yeah. The other thing uh, I was going to say, there is the importance of um, reframing things. Actually, that's no, what you're saying there is that the, the anxiety and things like that is um, sometimes like, like myself sort of, um, geez, I'm busier. I've got some things coming up that are, uh, not not comfortable, like you know, a little bit out of my comfort zone. Anything, I feel a little bit stressed, and then noticing myself, like, geez, I got amongst my tasks today. Like, I was really proactive. Like, I was working to, you know, make sure you're organized, make sure you're across this because you got something coming up that you, you're not quite sure of. And then, in terms of being able to like reflect on it, like, if that stress wasn't there, would I have been that productive today? Would I have improved? Like, I, I did some things I would not have done. That's improved me. And the thing that did that was that heightened level of stress. And so. Yeah trying to re- reflect on it and go, well, it wasn't the most enjoyable experience, but it did have a positive impact for me and trying to sort of keep that in mind. So the next time something like that comes up, I'm like, okay, well, not comfortable, but ultimately good for me. 
I often I say to I often say to my clients, you know, be be comfortable being uncomfortable. It just means change is happening. And um, you know, actually, probably about six six months, maybe nearly twelve months. Actually, got the years gone really quick. But we we had um, an organisation that we would get referrals from, and it was actually a big part of our business uh, uh, for a long time. And all of a sudden, they lost the funding, so we lost a huge amount of monthly income. And now I could have gotten really upset and anxious about that and, oh, what am I going to do and everything? But I kind of looked and went, well, okay, now that's gone. We can be so much more creative and do other things now. So it gave, and I looked at the time that we had now that we could actually be creative and we've gotten through it really easy <laughs> because of it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, we can get so caught up in our own stuff sometimes that um, we, but we allow it to. We allow it to get to us. And if we have a different way of being able to think about something or approach it in a different way, we have so much, so many better outcomes. You know? yeah. so better. I think that's a, a really powerful reflection. And I, I don't think there'd be a business in anywhere that wasn't touched by COVID recently, the impacts that yeah. that had. And yeah, you could, you could either go, well, woe is us or what can we do here? And similarly, we we transitioned and had a, a much bigger focus on our telehealth for the virtual sessions, which was mm. not something that we had really touched on before. We never had to, but it was a skill set that we ended up developing was, okay, how can we roll these out? How can we communicate this to people? And, and it's something that we, we now maintain and it's a almost an additional service that we have now that we wouldn't have had, but for this pretty ordinary circumstance, and I'm, I don't want it back, but... Um, uh-huh. I guess sort of trying to reframe again, it's a, a positive that came out of a, a pretty awful situation, but I guess like touching on, this is a perhaps a slightly different element of the same thing, but, um, and I spoke about this with uh, Holly in a previous podcast, but one of the, I, I guess, a mindfulness practice that I had uh, and, and would implement and still do at times is um, a bit of mindfulness or journaling reflection. I think that all comes under one umbrella for me, but I would write down at the end of the day or end of the week, like what happened. And, and I found in that process, I was just writing down the same negative thoughts because the negative thing was the thing that's I'm just marinating on. I can't, can't move on from it, but it would be in my head. And I'm like, okay, I'll write this down because I, it'll be good for me. I'll get it out. And, and all I'd be doing is just every day writing down negative thoughts. And then I think I'm asking you, is it, is this an NLP technique? But I sort of started to, all right, you've written that down now. Can you challenge that thought? Can you write that same thing, but from a different perspective? So if it involved another person, can you write this down again from their perspective? And it, and it would lower the sort of the negative thoughts on that, maybe one or two points, but enough to say, okay, I feel a bit better about this. And then over time, stopped interpreting it like that in the first place. Yeah. Is that something that is NLP and yeah, can you speak? Yeah, in a way, um, it's interesting around journaling. I, um I actually had a lady come and see me once who had been seeing somebody else for a really long time and she thought, and then she got really bad again. And she said, I need to come and see somebody. She said, I thought I was doing really, really well. I said, well, tell me what, what happened? What, what happened? She goes, I was doing well. And my, um, and my therapist actually said to me, you know, look, because she journaled a lot of stuff. And she said, why don't you have a look and back and see where you were back then to how you are now, which was an, kind of a cool thing to do it'd be an okay thing they actually brought up all that old stuff again and that's why she started to go backwards so sometimes journaling is a is a is a good thing to get it out but I always say don't go back and read it <laughs> don't go back <laughs> and read it. But, but kind of like it's a good way of getting it out um in in saying that too like I, I think when, when we kind of look at situations from a different perspective and possibly from a dissociated perspective it's kind of like as I was having this conversation yesterday with a client in Sydney and I I said to her you know dissociation is actually really important I mean you, you have association and dissociation if you're in a situation or there's something that's happened and you're associated with it it means that you're kind of in the experience and there's feeling involved in it but sometimes when we dissociate you know that's when we're out of the experience but we're with no feeling but we're kind of able to look at it from a different angle um, and get more information. And sometimes the key is about stepping back and looking at it. There's a there's actually a process that we do in NLP, which is called perceptual positions. And um, it's kind of like looking at a situation and being able to step out of that and watching you in that situation and getting and the other person in that situation 
and getting more information about what was happening there for you to have a better understanding of it. Um, you know, whenever I'm seeing my clients, I've got to be dissociated, don't I? Could you imagine if I was associated listening to all my client stuff? I'm like, oh, terrible, isn't it? It's awful. <laughs> you know, but but I need to be dissociated to be able to be objective and look at something from a different perspective. So um, I think what, what you're talking about there yeah, is, is actually getting something out, but kind of stepping back and looking at it from a different angle, I guess, in, in a sense to get different a different kind of meaning out of whatever it was that happened. Yeah, that's re- that's so interesting. I'm sort of sitting here again, reflecting a little bit. And and one of the, uh, I guess, authors, people that I would look to as a kind of a role model, someone to learn from was uh, Jocko Willink. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him, but he's done some um, some leadership books. And one of his principles was detachment, which is being able to step away from the process and exactly what you've just said and, and look at things uh, almost from a third person perspective and go, is this the best approach here? Like rather than being, I'm so involved in this that I can't sort of see what is actually happening. And it's interesting that, and I'm speaking to this because I know that there's other people that have this approach and it's, or this mindset, I should say initially, it's like, oh, I don't really want to go and uh, investigate these other models. If it's NLP or speaking with a counselor or things like that, because it's a bit, maybe they perceive it as like woo woo, or that's not me, or, you know, it's, I'm hard and I like to do it this way. And, and that's where I think that sort of person, he was a Navy SEAL that, that appeals to them in that way. But the topics that he's talking about are really shared across these different fields, I guess, like a detachment is, it's not an, uh, a foreign concept to what we're talking about here in NLP. And I think that's an important realization as well. Yeah, it really is. It is and, and look, even stepping out and detaching sometimes, it, there's a lot of self-awareness that can come from that by looking at yourself in that different perspective. You know, I actually had this client come in and say, he's, he's actually done both um, NLP practitioner and master practitioner now. And he came and saw me and the first session I was explaining to him, you know, around his representation system and the way he does things. And being on the spectrum for him, he's like 30, 30 or so, 30 years old, I think. And he just looked at me and said, why hasn't anybody ever explained this to me? He said, now I know how I work. I can deal with myself a little bit better. And he's he's actually going to be a coach now for other kids on the spectrum and um, there are other people on the spectrum. And it, it's just interesting. So he often will step out of himself now and kind of look at a situation and then kind of think of it in a completely different way. So, you know, even with a girlfriend, he's got a girlfriend now. And it was really interesting because, like, he never thought he was good enough to have a girlfriend. But, you know, when we talk about leaning into something and it's been given him the ability to lean into fear and actually just go with it and change things and it's created a whole different life for him now. So, yeah, detachment is really important to be able to look at things from a different angle and get a different perspective on it and get some different meaning out of something that you that you're going through. I mean, we, we all go through shit. <laughs> we all go through a lot of stuff. But you know, we and we go through some really terrible stuff, but we always come out the other side with resources. We we, we would have learned we've definitely learned something out of whatever it is we've gone through. Definitely. Mm. Definitely. I think that's uh yeah, it's really powerful stuff there. <laughs> It's not easy though. That's what I would say. Like, we just, just step back, just just remove yourself from it, and and look at this externally. And there's a lot of ego involved typically, and so being able to to be aware of that and and step, I'm right. Like, mm. you know, to to deal with that, um, that's not easy. So it's certainly something we need to practice and work at. And are there are there any ways that we can practice at that sort of daily? Are there little strategies that you think you can try this one thing and that would help? Yeah, um, I mean, look, the, that perceptual positions is a really good one to use a lot. I, I think that's true. And look, but how I, I actually use that in a very conversational way with somebody, if I'm seeing somebody, I don't miss, I do take them through the process sometimes, but um, but more more than not, more, more often I'll kind of say something along the lines of, you know, if you're a fly on the wall watching you do that, what would you notice? Yeah. So it automatically gets them to dissociate from it, but they're looking at it from a different angle. So, uh, and and I, I often do that myself. I'll sit there, okay, if I was a fly on the wall watching what just happened, <laughs> how would I do things differently? Or what, what information do I have now that I can utilize the next time this ha- thing happens? Yeah. But leaning into something, I mean, when, when 
what's uh, the biggest thing that kind of stops us from doing things is basically feeling and feelings are just that feeling you know when you when you have a thought you release a chemical creates a feeling that feeling will generate a behavior so if you interrupt that between that thought and the feeling and you let the thought go for a walk and just focus in on the feeling where is it in my body what does it feel like what would it look like if i could see it what would it feel like if i could touch it i can guarantee that the feeling will actually go away It'll go away within, a, they say about 90 seconds, but it's never lasted 90 seconds for me. It's always been about probably 20, 25 seconds or something. But just detaching the thought, the feeling can't exist without the thought. So it's a bit of practice to do that, but it's a really good way of being able to kind of disconnect the thought feeling. And then then you're kind of in a bit of a dissociated um, space where you can look at things a little bit differently. It sounds to me a little bit like mindfulness, a mindfulness practice. Yeah, it could be a bit of mindfulness. Yeah, mindfulness. So we're not. We're we're kind of. We're still getting rid of the thought. You know, we want to get let the thought go for a walk. <laughs> you know, that's conscious. You know, and that's the you know in NLP that's what we're we're focusing on the unconscious mind and um, you know knowing that our you know our conscious mind's only ten percent, our unconscious mind is ninety percent. So yeah. it's all the stuff that goes on without us having to think about. Yeah, but some of the patterns that we in we are in started off from a conscious thought. Yeah, cool. So much, so much in that. We I think we could talk for hours. But um, yeah. where, where can people find you and and specifically these programs if they want to learn a little bit more about NLP and and the various other courses programs that you're running, Adam? Yeah, sure. Um, so. Uh, I, I I have two businesses. So one is the AJR AJR Counseling, Coaching and Consulting, and the other business is the AJR International Academy of NLP. So I started that a couple of years ago. Um, I've delivered five practitioners now and a couple of master practs, but I teach in Singapore and I'm not in. I do a breakthrough course in Singapore which I'm doing in November and we're going to be in Switzerland as well, I think next year, but I run courses all through the year. So I run them here. I've got a training room in Budgie on the central coast. So if you look up the AJR International Academy of NLP, you'll see on our website, there's all the dates there of all the upcoming courses that we do. Um, we also run workshops as well. So um, we do parenting workshops. We do even an introduction to NLP. So it's just a day uh, where you can come along and try it and see what it's like. And um, I put out, I do a Zoom call every now and again where people who want to just find some information out about it, um, they can log on on our Facebook page. The link will be there. Um, certain dates that I do it, I don't know. I don't know when my next one is, but um, I'm sure it'll be soon. But we also run uh, uh, with our courses. It's not just you come and do the course and you go on. Um, we have a lot of after course learning as well, which is absolutely free. We hold, I run practice groups as well. So we can practice the processes that you learn in NLP. Um, and I'm actually it's really nice. I've built quite a nice NLP community around here and we're all in contact. They all, all the students and students graduation page, graduates page where they can all talk to each other as well. So yeah, there's lots of after course learning and you can even come back and review and do your NLP practitioner or NLP master practitioner. Um, once you've done the first one, you can come back and review it at like a real minimal fee. So I think that's a wonderful element of the of the course, to be honest. It's it's obviously involved. There's a lot in it. And then there's understanding it and then the application of some, some of the concepts. It, you know, you're probably going to want to come back and just check in on understanding or, or your, your ability to deliver it. So I think that's a, an awesome um, element of the course. It's and it's certainly something that I, I encourage people um, when I'm talking to them is, you know, like there are the, f the fundamental courses and skill sets that you will need as a, an EP or mm. physio, whatever it might be. But these soft skills that we're talking about here and being able to communicate effectively with a range of different people really does set up your effectiveness to implement the harder skills like a, a prescription or if it's a manual therapy, things like that. So um, consideration of these things is something that I'm, I really talk about and I've obviously reached out and I've spoken to you about these courses as well. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great course that we all should be considering, but um, before we wrap it up, are there, are there anything else, any other things that you wanted to, to cover off today or how do we go? Uh, if I, if you start me talking about NLP, you'll be, you'll have me for hours. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's been fantastic. Like I think we've only just touched on really like what is a, a very 
interesting and involved topic, but um, yeah, we could certainly talk more. We might have it, have to get you on and, and talk about it again. Yeah, absolutely. I guess the last thing to finish off, remember that with NLP, it's not just for your business or for your work. This is something, NLP is something you can take into your own life. And, you know, it's improved greatly relationships that I've had and uh, that I have. Um, being able to communicate and understand my partner better, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, so I it does, it, it's across the board. It's across the board, not just in one area it's it's for everything so life, i think that's an important so. life skill is not a work skill yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. cool i think that's a great point where we can uh wrap it up adam mm, thank you thanks for having me no thanks thank for coming on mate it's been fantastic i appreciate it good stuff cheers all right see you next time